after taking a bit of a sidestep to cover the sensors, let's return to the piano action. Last we talked about it, I covered the initial prototype and mentioned that it had flaws big enough to put the entire project in jeopardy. Well, in the end I solved those issues, so let's cover the updated and final uh, eight key prototype, the differences between it and the initial prototype, and why they were necessary in the first place. Now, the most striking change is definitely the addition of color, but after that would probably be the replacement of the placeholder backplate with its finished counterpart, complete with the electronics assembly. Uh, I even added an access port in the back here in order to easily reprogram the microcontroller as I didn't want to have to disassemble the entire piano in order to update the firmware in the inevitable case where it becomes necessary in the not so distant future. Moving on, in the bottom section here is the weight adjustment mechanism. Now, the original Hickman Action patent papers actually included a similar feature of a spring attached to the key levers right here, uh, whose strength could be adjusted both on a per key basis via this adjustment screw and uh, for all keys simultaneously through this mechanism, which was controlled via this control lever right here. And this was marketed as allowing the pianist to dial in a lighter or heavier feeling action as desired, with no mention of its effects on the hammer action. So I thought I could get away with ignoring it and simply using uh, the two counterweights on the front and back rotors along with the adjustment weights per key in order to dial in a 50 gram key down weight instead for each key. In actuality, I found that not using uh, such a system led to a slower repetition action than I wanted. So I dropped one of the two uh, counter key weights in favor of a spring-based weight adjustment mechanism in the back instead. If I now section off the design at the third key, you'll be able to see that the weight adjustment mechanism is rather simple. Each key has its own spring that pushes down on the back rotor and is attached on the other side to a plug. This plug can be moved up and down via an adjustment screw that'll go into this hole right here, which increases or decreases the strength of the spring and is thus used to calibrate a given key's weight. The rod right here pushes down on the spring and can be turned to adjust the weight of every spring simultaneously, essentially changing the overall feel of the piano from light to heavy action. Uh, moving on, the hammers of the original design were rather simplistic, and so in addition to adding the necessary flags for the key hit and velocity sensing, I've also split the hammerhead in two so as to print the top or the actual hammerhead in white, representing the felt of the actual hammers, and the body in gray. Uh, in addition, the hammer shanks, which used to be just pure plastic uh, pieces, have been replaced with carbon fiber rods, which not only makes the design look better, but also helps to uh, fix a weight imbalance issue I had, where the center of gravity of the hammer plus the hammer shank was closer to the middle here, as opposed to the back towards the hammer, which was causing uh, issues with the action, especially in the... Uh, cases of the more lightweight hammers where it was really moving uh, back towards the driving lever. Uh, speaking of the driving lever, that's the last uh, update, at least in this section, where I had to add a adjustment screw to the bottom here that sets the uh, upper or the maximum uh, hammer height before it flies up to hit the hammer head felt. When going over the initial design, I mentioned that the original Hickman Action had two more adjustment screws that I decided against including, a let off adjustment screw right here and a maximum hammer height screw right here. I said that since the parts are going to be designed in CAD and printed with high tolerances, I didn't need to bother with either of these two, unlike if the parts were made from wood by hand. Well, I was partially right, which is just another way of saying I was wrong. And you see, even though I didn't need to care about the hammer hitting the string and dropping down to let it ring, my decision to trigger the key hit and velocity sensors via the hammer 
right here meant that the maximum hammer height needed to be adjusted quite precisely with respect to the sensors. Uh, too low and quiet notes might not register, uh, too high and I'd have issues with multiple hits registering when you play a single note. I couldn't find an easy way to place the adjustment screws in the original locations, so I had to improvise and uh, place just a single adjustment screw right at the tip here. It doesn't allow for as much customization as having two screws, but it does its job uh, well enough in my design. Uh, the last thing that I wanna talk about, at least in terms of the action, would be this spring right here. Now this spring isn't to be found in either my initial design or the original Hickman action that it's based on. So why was it necessary? Well, it's a fix for the exact problem that almost caused me to drop this action altogether and switch back to a classical simple hammer digital piano. But rather than try and explain the issue, let me show you it first in the short slow motion clip of the action in action. And so let me play out the same motion by hand and uh, try and explain. Upon the key being pressed, the jack here will rise, pushing up on the driving lever and causing the hammer to rise as well, like so. At a certain point, the let off mechanism begins, followed almost immediately by the driving lever reaching its maximum rotation and the decoupling of the jacks. In the ideal case scenario, the driving lever would simply stay still while the hammer flies up to bridge the small gap. The sensors in that gap would trigger a key hit event and log the velocity. The hammer would then bounce back from the hammer hit felt, forcing the driving lever to counter rotate until the hammer is caught by the back check. And this is what happens on a light key press. For medium or heavy hits, the action looks uh, more like this. All right, now with a bit of an explanation. So after the decoupling of the jacks, the driving lever reaches its maximum rotation and it immediately begins to counter rotate even as the hammer is flying up, uh, possibly due to the momentum of the jacks decoupling. Uh, this causes the bottom of the hammer to extend, colliding with the back check early and thus making the hammer lose all momentum. This means that when the driving lever rotates back to where it needs to be, the hammer is let go of the back check, allowing it to be pushed back up by the driving lever, usually with enough force to make it fly back into range of the sensors and triggering a second key hit event. Possibly even worse, this sequence of events is much more prevalent on lower weighted hammers, so I didn't even notice this until I finished building the second prototype with its graded hammers, 4 grams on the latest and 15 grams on the heaviest. Now, there were many attempts at fixing this issue and much use of the slow-mo feature of my GoPro camera, including this one where I thought to tightly couple the driving lever to the hammer via the top limiter and later a spring. Uh, but the top limiter actually made things worse and the version I ended up um, adopting was this one with a simple spring between the driving lever and the hammer essentially making it so that when the driving lever starts to counter rotate and the hammer flies up to hit the hammer felt, the spring would pull the two back together before the bottom of the hammer could hit the back check and ruin everything. Interestingly enough, the springs had to be graded based on the hammer weight with the latest hammers requiring a very strong springs while the heaviest hammers could be just fine even without a spring. Now, I'll be honest, uh, the original design of the Hickman Action doesn't have the spring, so there must be an alternate way that this issue was solved. The closest mention I could find in the patent papers was the addition of this felt and limiter right here, which is supposed to, and I'm paraphrasing here uh, from the patent papers, uh, prevent freezing, which may sometimes occur in case of extraordinary fast repetition or in cases of extremely heavy blows. This sounds exactly like what I was experiencing, but in my case, the limiter did nothing to solve the issue. Perhaps the placement of the back check is a bit too high in my design, or the shape of the action just isn't right for it to solve the issue. But 
Without access to an authentic Hickman action that I could test in slow motion and copy the part dimensions from, my only options were to tackle this problem in a different way. Maybe at some point in the future I'll revisit this, but honestly, it works quite well as it is, so for now this is where I'll finish my adjustments to the piano action, and instead let's focus on the last major change, the keys themselves. The initial ones had a few glaring problems. I designed them after I planned out the key lever assembly with their counterweights, which necessitated this uh, cutout. Uh, furthermore, the front guide pins had to be placed quite far down from the uh, buttons in order to have enough space on the odd numbered keys for the enclosure, along with the attachment uh, cutout right here. Altogether, this meant that the key had a very complicated shape, so printing it was a pain. In the end, I had to resort to cutting it in half and uh, printing it side by side. But, uh, well, this had a bunch of other issues I don't really want to talk about, but suffice it to say, I needed to reprint uh, four out of the eight keys when building the initial prototype. All of this would have been acceptable if it wasn't for the biggest issue. The side-to-side -side wiggle of the keys was more than I expected, uh, to the point I was pretty sure the keys would click against one another if I was to play glissandos along the first couple of rows, or alternatively needed to make long jumps across the keyboard, which uh, tends to apply quite a bit of lateral forces on the keys. Which brings us to the updated design. The removal of the counterweight from the front rotor allowed me to move the back bottom key guide pins uh, closer towards the center, uh, decreasing the key's side to side flex. The front guide pin was moved to be as close to the button surfaces as possible while leaving the key with a solid connection, which was possible due to moving the front rotor attachment point from the second row here to the third row right here. Uh, this allowed me to stagger the guide pins to be under the second row for the odd numbered keys and the first row for the even numbered keys with the key felt uh, going between them. With these new guide pin locations, the side to side flex of the key was decreased to acceptable levels and allowed for a simplified design with a flat bottom. Here, let me place the two prototypes side by side and uh, show you. The initial version on the bottom allows for a um, worrying amount of side to side sway, while the updated version on the top is a lot more solid. Now returning back to CAD, there is one last thing I want to mention in regards to the keys, and it's this uh, bevel along the back. Now, with all the problems I had printing the keys previously, I wanted to simplify the process, and the solution I came up with was to print the keys like so. Now, the buttons are now sloped at 45 degrees, which is good enough to make post-processing easier. Uh, speaking of post-processing, I spent quite a bit of time trying uh, various options, spray painting, uh, gap filling with resin, sanding, printing the buttons separately and attaching them afterwards, in the end, the best option I came up with was a two-step approach of vapor smoothing followed by a directional sanding to give the buttons a good texture. And this unfortunately meant that I had to switch from PTG that I was using for the rest of the piano to ASA as PTG can't be vapor smoothed with acetone. So a key fresh off the printer would look something like this. As you can see, you can uh, clearly notice the layer lines on the buttons, which make the surface uh, very rough and not that good for playing on. I then cover the sections that I didn't want to smooth out, such as the sides with a uh, packing tape, before placing the key in an acetone vapor bath for 40 minutes, followed by letting it dry for 24 hours. This would leave the keys uh, looking more like this. As you can see, the sections that were covered in packing tape are still the same um, unsmoothed, while the buttons and the sections that were left uh, uncovered have now have this very uh, glossy uh, finish to them. Uh, this is actually not ideal because while the smooth surfaces certainly do look nice, the smooth texture isn't great for a piano key. It's got the extra cheap plasticky feel to it, in addition to sticking a bit too much to your fingers if you try and glide them over the key. 
To solve that, I gave each button a careful pass with a 600 grit sandpaper, uh, taking care to go in only a single direction along the key, uh, which ended up giving it this sort of almost a uh, wood grain uh, look. Uh, it's actually easier to see in person than uh, on camera, but nothing I can do about that. It's still obviously plastic, but like, you know, high quality textured plastic rather than the cheap of uh, pure acetone smoothing version. Um, I tried painting it over with acrylic paint and uh, even varnish, but both were worse both in uh, feel and look than just the simple sanded variant. So I stuck to that one. And so this brings us to the end of the finalized action that I'll be using in the DIY Jenko uh, digital piano. In fact, I already had a piano technician go over it and give me the green light with the promise to come back uh, once I have the finished piano. According to him, the action feels quite good and is close to what he expects from a well-regulated uh, grand piano, certainly better than any digital piano he tried. The only gripe he has with it is the obviously plastic keys, but look, I haven't found a way for ASA to feel like ivory yet, so this is the best I can do. Well, until the next time, bye.